Hello, I'm Dr. Nicole Price, Senior Research Scientist at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences in East Booth Bay, Maine. I also direct our Center for Seafood Solutions that matches our cutting edge science with research needs identified by environmental groups, policymakers, and industry. Since its inception in 2015, we've been asked by every type of stakeholder whether or not farmed seaweed can be used to mitigate climate change and have been working on all aspects of this potential solution. Today, I will be reviewing what we know to date about carbon dioxide removal and storage by foresting the ocean with cultivated seaweeds. And I will identify some key knowledge gaps to address in order to evaluate the risks and opportunities to use seaweed farming as an ocean negative emissions technology. The idea of blue carbon or carbon becoming buried in marine sediments at sufficient timescales to be considered truly sequestered and removed from the global carbon cycle is far more established for marine angiosperms like mangroves, seagrasses, another type of true plant, and salt marshes. These flowering plants have roots and rhizomes that bury carbon in the sediment below them where it can stay for centuries or even millennia. Lisa Wyndham Myers from USGS will be offering a more thorough discussion of these marine habitats contribution to carbon dioxide removal technology. Seaweeds have long been left out of the blue carbon discussion, but should they be? This talk is broken into four sections. And the first question I will address is, should seaweeds be part of the blue carbon conversation? Part of the reason that seaweeds get left out of the blue carbon conversation is because their natural life history seemingly suggests they don't contribute carbon to marine sediments. They have generally speaking short life cycles and while there are photosynthetic organisms that fix carbon in their fronds and blades, their stipes and holdfasts are used merely to attach the alga to rocky surfaces on the seafloor. They do not directly transfer carbon into sediments during growth. Whether they are eventually consumed by fish or macroinvertebrate herbivores, or remineralized by microbial films as they senesce. It has been generally assumed that the biogenically fixed carbon is released back to the carbon cycle on rather short time scales, like weeks to years. But a missing piece of the puzzle is an understanding of the fate of broken off pieces of seaweed detritus. We are only beginning to learn how far and fast particulate organic matter of seaweeds travels and what becomes of it. For instance, the sinking speed of seaweed particles depends on the tissue type and the size of the particle. Whether or not the particle has passed through the gut of an herbivore and been turned into feces, and, and all of these can vary by orders of magnitude, the sinking speeds. For those ranges of sinking speeds that have been reported, and across different current speeds or eventual settling depths. The export distance can also vary by orders of magnitude from tens of meters to hundreds of thousands of meters. In fact, seaweed particles are detectable using isotope analyses all over the world's oceans and in locations far from the natal bed with many of these observations coming from thousands of meters deep. A one-year study in the English Channel used eDNA sequencing, Bayesian stable isotope mixing modeling, and benthic pelagic process assays to verify that seaweed particles are delivered up to 5,000 kilometers offshore and 200 meters deep. And these studies account for, um, and the particles account for roughly 30% of deep coastal benthic diets. So seaweed is an important part of the benthic e ecosystem in these deep um, marine environments. The authors estimated annual burial rates for all sources of blue carbon and for seaweeds in particular. So in this graph, carbon flux um, by total blue carbon is in blue and seaweeds alone is in green. And the flux rates correspond to seasonality and primary production. In this system, in the English Channel, the average net sedimentary organic macroalgal carbon sequestration was 8.75 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. Environmental DNA approaches have also allowed us to look further under the hood for sources of carbon deposited in more traditional shallow blue carbon ecosystems like seagrass beds and mangroves, where carbon is sequestered in the sediments that are entrained in root systems. 
Seaweed DNA represents roughly 33% of the genetic material found in these sediments, whether in seagrass beds or in mangrove forests. And seaweeds are likely a larger contributor to this carbon pool than had previously been appreciated. Using the best information available at the time, Dorte Cross Jensen and Carlos Duarte developed a seaweed particle transport model to estimate the portions of the biogenically captured carbon in kelp forests that are exported off the continental shelf, buried in the continental shelf, or remineralized, or buried in deeper offshore sediments. Highlighted in blue in this graphic are the estimates of the particulate organic carbon and dissolved organic carbon that are buried in sediments or exported below the mixed layer, representing removal from the global carbon cycle. They estimate that anywhere from three to 26% of the carbon captured by seaweed eventually becomes sequestered. At a global scale, this represents roughly 173 teragrams sequestered per year, similar to the sequestration rate of forests in North America. As of now, these sequestration rates are rarely in included in any geopolitical carbon budget. However, sea means are not immune to the same global changes that plague other marine organisms. Warming surface ocean temperatures, marine heat waves, ocean acidification, sea level rise, each may have impacts on subtidal and intertidal seaweed species. In 2011, a landmark paper was among the first to report evidence of seaweed species shifting ranges polewards along the Australian coasts, using over 20,000 herbarium records to make this um, to, to discover this trend. This range shift correlated with concurrent reports of rising water temperatures along the Australian shores. A cascade of research exploring impacts of temperature and CO2 enrichment on various species of seaweeds has followed and have shown that species generally respond negatively to relative warming. There's an increasing evidence that CO2 fertilization has mixed effects somewhat related to whether or not the alga uses carbon concentrating mechanisms to access inorganic carbon, in, inorganic carbon and also dependent on the life stage of the species. This is also a very species dependent process. Recently, we've conducted some work to, in, in the Price Lab to explore um, how different species of seaweeds and other macrophytes respond to increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide. We've been challenging the presumption that seaweeds photosynthetic efficiency or O2 evolved per CO2 fixed is constant and propose the hypothesis that efficiency might be dependent on the CO2 availability. And in fact, for sugar kelp and eelgrass, the more CO2 you enrich with, the more oxygen is released in uh, short assays and DIC is fixed per biomass and volume of seawater. This, as I said, this is also true for the dissolved inorganic carbon. So the more carbon enrichment there is in the system, the more CO2 um, and inorganic carbon, either carbon dioxide or bicarbonate, the organism is able to fix. In fact, sugar kelp is so CO2 starved relatively speaking, that in a future ocean, it may be able to locally and ephemerally reduce the impacts of acidification for other calcifiers growing nearby. So how these species will react in a future warmer, more acidic ocean is really um, still quite complicated. The interactive effects of CO2 enrichment and warming are an active area of research. As always, a biological response to multiple stressors is difficult to predict. But there are reasons to hope that certain genotypes of some kelp species may be better adapted to warming waters in particular. This leads me to the third section of the talk, which is what is ocean afforestation? Well, the fact that there are species that may have genotypes adapted to warming is good news for ocean afforestation. But what does this term refer to? I have to be honest, um, I had not been using this term before being invited to give this talk. So ocean afforestation was a term coined about a decade ago to refer to the combined processes of seaweed farming and biomass use to generate food and feedstock for biogas energy sources. An added proposed benefit of 
growing or farming seaweed in the ocean was habitat creation and nutrient capture. But some major assumptions of the original proposed model were that the additional measures needed additional measures, sorry, additional measures would needed would be need to be taken to sequester the captured CO2 for storage in containment systems or burial on the seafloor, in the seafloor. Even so, the estimated carbon storage and avoidance values led to a net negative or carbon removal process that was promising. The authors of this work proposed that the appropriate scale for ocean afforestation would be roughly 10,000 hectare farms which was a bold proposal given that <laughs> no one um, was farming at this scale at the time. In practice, individual um, seaweed farms come in all shapes and sizes. The most common practice is long line farming in shallow coastal zones using an anchoring and float system. Although the practice is centuries old, it's very nascent in the US and the first commercial kelp farm was established in Casco Bay, Maine near Portland in 2009. Seaweed farming is appealing because it can be done with very low tech approach and thus requires relatively little capital or operating expenses to get started as compared to other aquaculture ventures. Further, the first crop is harvestable after just about six months, six months, compared to other aquaculture ventures like shellfish or finfish that take three years to a decade in order to get your first harvest, this is a very quick turnaround. As of now, only 10 species are intensively cultivated worldwide, but there are hundreds of species wild harvested for various products. Seaweed farming yields a nutritional sustainable project, product in an increasingly food insecure world. It also perhaps is the only ocean negative emissions technology that can generate revenue for small businesses and rural working waterfront communities, something that's important to folks in Maine. Ocean afforestation is also a scalable solution in nearshore environments. Let me just get this video to play, apologies. In the US, the Department of Energy ARPA-E program has invested $50 million into figuring out how to scale up offshore aquaculture of seaweeds. And in China, modular approaches to seaweed farming have expanded to large spatial areas, some even visible from space. Not quite the 10,000 hectares, but getting there. Interest in ocean afforestation and seaweed farming has been growing rapidly and the annual landings are on an exponential growth curve worldwide. Regardless whether historical estimates or recent estimates of sector growth over the past few years are used, global seaweed production is set to surpass potato production in the coming decades. With this much seaweed produced and an estimate of 11% sequestration due to burial of naturally slopped detritus, approximately 4.5 teragrams carbon of carbon per year extra could be sequestered on top of the natural processes from wild seaweed beds. So the question remains, can farm seaweeds truly sequester carbon? The role of seaweeds in blue carbon strategies remains controversial, despite seaweed habitats being the most extended, productive, and diverse among the macrophyte systems and marine systems. The criteria for inclusion in the discussion hinges upon how extensive and actionable ocean afforestation or seaweed farming will be, and development of verified standards that carbon removal is from farmed seaweeds is real, measurable, permanent, unique, and additional. And the slide was courtesy of Carlos Duarte. As is this. About a year ago, Ocean's 2050 Foundation started a global project to quantify carbon burial and sediments below 20 seaweed farms across the world. And these farms vary in age. Some are 10 years old, some are 300 years old, size from two to 15,000 hectares, and species produced. Cores are currently being analyzed for isotopes and eDNA to quantify the carbon burial process. And the sample analysis should be complete maybe even this month. Um, this is a project led by Carlos Duarte and there are three analytical labs um, that are doing the analyses. 
The project spans 12 countries and five continents. Um, but there is only one U.S. farm that was old enough to be included in the study, the first kelp farm in Casco Bay, Maine. Bigelow is proud and excited to be part of this work, and we have other partners that are helping us with collecting cores, um, and importantly, seaweed farmer partners uh, in order to do this, this work. Through partnerships, Bigelow is also working on quantifying almost all aspects of climate services of farm seaweeds and starting to get estimates for rates related to yields for popular kelp species. I find it exciting to think about both carbon removal technologies like carbon sequestration, but also avoided emissions uses of the seaweed product, whether it be for bioenergy production, reduction of methane emissions for ruminants um, or other applications. There remain, however, major knowledge gaps to determining the contribution, risks, and opportunities that ocean afforestation presents as a negative emissions technology. Some of these include what are the species specific carbon deposition rates. The one study from the English Channel was for a laminaria species that um, often isn't farmed. Um, and the Cross Jensen and Duarte estimates from 2016 were not species specific, but were for seaweed writ large. How are those rates going to vary by species? Um, we don't know. Can we accurately predict and verify where detritus goes and how long the carbon stays buried? Clearly, this is going to be a regionally specific sort of answer um, for where the seaweed is grown. And if seaweed offshore aquaculture is started, then we need to understand where those um, bits of detritus are going as well. There's a, a sort of a philosophical question about whether or not to sink the seaweed that has been produced to maximize the carbon burial rate potential by the farm seaweed or to use the farm seaweed as an edible product and in other products that have a reduced life cycle emissions or help avoid emissions from other non-renewable energy sources. What is the ecological and social carrying capacity for farmed seaweed? That's also going to be regionally specific answer. Can seaweeds adapt to warming through husbandry? And even if they can adapt to warming through husbandry, are farmers permitted to put these selected seaweeds out in open cultivation systems? And then finally, what is the full life cycle of seaweed production? Um, there's only the, a few publications beginning to come out trying to estimate these um, processes and uh, carbon production or use rates, but inventories are sparse, I would say, and still need a lot of work. So thank you for listening to the talk. Um, ahead of our meeting and looking forward to the workshop discussions. Thank you.